I'm going to uh, uh, talk to you uh, about uh, uh, pop, uh, one kind of populism, which has been very much on my mind uh, 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 recently, which is a kind of populism that is embodied by uh, Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom or by Donald Trump here. Uh, which is one which is uh, what I call a kind of rule by acting. It's not the whole of uh, populist story as we've just heard before, but it's one in which performance plays uh, an enormously important role and performance of a certain kind. Uh, if any of you are fellow sufferers uh, from Boris Johnson, you know that he speaks only in cliches. And uh, uh, far be it for me to comment on Donald Trump, but it seems equally uh, uh, that the verbal dimension of uh, what's being uh, said is deeply familiar, indeed uh, um, uh, almost predictably familiar to what they're doing. So the effort that both of them have in order to rule is to enact by uh, nonverbal means what otherwise would be uh, very boring and familiar uh, uh, cliches. And I'm quite interested in, in that aspect of enactment. That is how um, performing of a nonverbal bodily sort uh, can actually do the work of, uh, of a, uh, a form of exacting submission from an audience. It's a familiar problem in, in the arts, but it has this political re uh, reflection as well. And to begin to just make clear a little what I mean by this, I'm going to uh, read to you something, just a, a, a personal experience of how this works in the realm which uh, I have been working on at the UN for the last uh, 12 years, which is climate change. And uh, what I'm going to describe to you is in the spirit of sociological inquiry, I went a few years ago to a climate change deniers conference at the Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to explain uh, or try to evoke to you a little uh, the ways in which this kind of nonverbal uh, performativity uh, uh, operates so that uh, we have rule by acting. At this conference, uh, uh, in Trump Hotel, by the way, I gather he's selling it. It's the most garish building uh, it, it seemed a fitting home for its name. Uh, the most striking group attending this climate deniers convention were some young, rather well-dressed students. And during a tea break, a young woman next in line helped me to sugar. Earnest and soft-spoken, she proved nothing like the stereotype of an intolerant right-winger. After she asked what I did, and I mentioned the words United Nations, she nodded politely. To paper over this unfortunate revelation, she began as Americans will when meeting strangers to tell me about herself. A libertarian, she was majoring in Ayn Rand studies at a local college. She's paying for that. She had come with a dozen or so classmates to whom I was introduced in turn and with whom I then had lunch. Ayn Rand, it transpired, had a lot to do with their interest in climate change. Rand's doctrines are all about individual initiative and students majoring in Ayn Rand's studies are likely to discredit impersonal forces beyond their control like climate change. At lunch, though, these kids evinced a certain open-mindedness which went well beyond politics. They did not dismiss as fake news my explanation of why each decimal point matters in global warming. 
but the open-mindedness lasted only until we adjourned for the big events in the ballroom. Then the malign powers of ruling by acting seized hold of the kids, turning them into an acid, angry crowd. Charts flashed by on a giant screen as each speaker proclaimed some version of the science is a fraud. The fraudsters were absent figures, professors from Harvard and MIT, professional do-gooders at the Rockefeller Foundation, and of course, UN bureaucrats. The audience responded by nodding or challenging, that's right. The charts were often too difficult to read. There was no verbal communication uh, as well because it was a, a series of, of, of uh, look at that and an image would flash on the screen and then disappear. The visceral bodily experience of theater kicked in throughout, however, through what country music singers call call and response. Do you know what that is? I call something out, you respond. The Ayn Rand study group, so restrained outside, at first just smiled at the familiar mantra, it's a fake, then began to clap, then began to chant the familiar lines. My colleague removed her spectacles, her eyes streaming from excitement. But this was not the end of the story. When the call and response ended, the kids' calm, good manners, and seriousness returned. Indeed, in another tea break, I have to say I was longing for a martini by this point, uh, um, my companions acknowledged rather shamefacedly that climate change is a real threat. The contrast Freud describes in his, uh, in his group psychology is that as a crowd, the kids became unthinking and let their aggressions hang out whereas a distinct group of individuals, they return to the realm of sober th uh, fact. Theater effected this transformation. That is, it was like pulling a trigger. And I want to explain to you a little about how uh, that works, in, in first in terms of a theory that's called the uh, uh, Cohen-Arendt hypothesis, about how what was going on in this, this hall. I hope I'm not talking too long. No. Um, in a remarkable study of apartheid South Africa, the sociologist Stanley Cohn explored what the white Burr community actually knew about conditions in the townships to which the black majority were confined. Cohn found that the whites, in fact, knew quite a lot about the miseries that the apartheid regime inflicted. But at the same time, they blotted out this awareness, claiming, for instance, that they had never heard about the typhoid ep epidemics which raged, ravaged the townships. But letting out, uh, pop out occasionally references to the typhoid scrooge, scourge. Challenged by the Cohen, the whites said, I can't handle talking about it. Cohn called this state of denial simultaneously knowing and not knowing. He asserted, and this is what makes this complex, that the more in, fa uh, in fact that people understood, the more they had to deny what they knew. Um, it was too overwhelming. Cohen's study reinforced an observation that Hannah Arendt had made decades before about German concentration camps. Ordinary Germans professed to know nothing about them, which Arendt didn't believe for a second. Too many Jews, Catholics, uh, homosexuals, Roma, and socialists had gone missing from the streets. It was not possible for the ordinary German not to wonder about how and where they had gone. This was the same syndrome operating among the young climate deniers. The facts were overwhelming. Theater of this particular sort enabled them to deny the reality. But the theater could not erase truth. Rather, as with the South African whites and the German civilians, 
art suspended truth. More, the theatrical device of call and response was aggressive, mocking, as though they had seen through the establishment, scientific and institutional, them, the power. Now, it's this uh, way of, in, of, of mobilizing uh, the anger that you were speaking about, populist anger, which is not rooted, it's, it's a sociological and psychological root rather than something which uh, could be traced back to capitalism. And it's one of the, re in particular, and it's one of the reasons that I think that in looking at the whole phenomenon of, uh, of populism, that the effort to tie it to economics is a little strained. There are different parameters which are coming into play in this kind of populist view. For the same reason, the discussion, as we heard in the previous talk, about migrants is a kind of suspicious, if it were a one, uh, one vector analysis, of what provokes this kind of aggression. The aggression is provoked by the experience of being in a theatrical situation where you become a participant. And uh, because the, the, I think the major threats to us now as a polity lie in, um, in uh, this kind of populist uh, thing, it's important to understand what is um, fundamental to it. Uh, the condition that um, uh, Stan Cohen and Hannah Arendt point to is one that really calls into question a whole uh, enlightenment uh, 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 mindset, which was that the more people know about something, the more they will embrace its reality. That is, that uh, factually, uh, that the project of enlightenment is a process of reason making and reason strengthening. I think that's quite naive that what uh, this little example I've given you about or uh, the Cohen Arendt hypothesis point to is that the more that people um, are uh, armed rationally with fact, uh, that the more uh, uh, angst that it, pr it produces and the desire for something uh, to deny the facts that they know perfectly well. For, uh, in other words, the proposition would be that uh, there's a paradox here uh, that... Uh, 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 that um, uh, that the, 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 the more rationality uh, that you seek to arouse in a public, the more this syndrome of denial through theatrical uh, behavior comes, uh, but it comes as a only temporary relief. It doesn't erase it. And it's a very important thing to know about uh, the kind of populism I'm talking about. These are not ignorant people. That's, that's a kind of condescending way of thinking about the problem that this, uh, this kind of rule by acting is engaging. It's, a, it's a creating a mechanism for emotional denial at the same time which, which offers temporary relief for a condition which people know perfectly well. Uh, I have to say that how, many, how much time do I have? Uh, I have to say that um, it points you know, with the value of hindsight to, I think, a huge error that we made in the UN and that other um, environmentalists have made. And that was the error of talking about climate change as climate disaster. Because what that provokes is uh, by trying to overwhelm people with the reality, with the facts of what things are, it provokes the desire to deny. 
It's not that it erases those facts, but it creates a sociological and uh, 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 performative palette in which people resist by both knowing uh, and not knowing of being absent. Uh, uh, the the rhetoric of climate change that w it it also also um, uh, evokes the um, the notion of well if there's nothing you can do about it, it doesn't matter you know it creates kind of passivity which is terrible uh, so that when I've thought about this um, as as it's affected the. I wouldn't, it's more than rhetoric, it's the way in which we've tried to energize from COP15 on the public. That focusing on the disastrous nature of the facts has been a way to grow the climate denier movement. It's had that counterproductive effect. And we needed to have found another way of speaking about this, which is uh, one that didn't kick in the opportunity to rule by acting in, in uh, this domain. Um, it's for the same reason that, uh, as you'll know, if you followed uh, COP26, which is in Glasgow, we had a little, um, uh, one of those mercury balls, you know, that falls down and uh, at a certain point it's too late and adaptation becomes more important than mitigation. I don't know if you ever saw this. This wasn't my invention. It was one of my most gifted people on my staff. Once that little ball fell be below the notion where uh, there was no uh, mitigation would be insufficient, you had had to adapt instead to climate change. We kicked in exactly the mentality of saying, uh, I'm going to deny this, because there was no agency that was given to people to deal with. As a final note about this, I would say that that is correct, however, that we have passed the point of no return. But oddly enough, in order to enable people to take some action, uh, that that fact itself has has become a kind of disabling fact for us, and we we no longer talk. As you'll see on Wednesday when we give a report to the UN uh, General Assembly, we don't use this language anymore. We've we've learned from this that this whole syndrome is something that re, re, rebounds on. Uh, enlightened people, which I think we all are, uh, to disable their ability to, to act. So that's what I wanted to say uh, about this. I don't know, do we have time for a question? I, I have to go back downtown, but I'd, I'd love to talk. I guess it's up to you then. Well, it's uh, one of those days, but uh, it's... Uh, uh, do you have any comments on this? Does it make sense to you what I'm... What I'm saying, uh, it's uh, philosophically, it's of course very depressing because uh, uh, the truth of, 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 of things is, uh, is uh, also something that is a provocation of an untruth uh, through this kind of behavior. Yeah. Are you saying then it's that we've engendered a sense of powerlessness and that this reaction of populism, denialism, is a way of exerting control, even if it's negative control? Yes, you things? could look at it. That, that's a very interesting way to put it. That is, that it, as in this little thing in the Trump Hotel, those kids as a mass felt empowered. By, by this, it's a very interesting way to put this. As students uh, of Anne Rand's studies, of course that shouldn't have been, you know, because you're not supposed to group think. But that's a, yes, that's a good way to put it. And it's a dilemma, 
you know, we have to deal with this crisis. And uh, I was very struck this year, for instance, that we did a calculation which we're going to explain on Wednesday about um, excessive deaths due to heat, heat stroke, particularly in people my age, elderly people like me. Uh, it's a huge number, uh, but it was very seldom reported in the press because it's such a huge number uh, that uh, it's kind of overwhelming. People can't deal with it, you know? And that's, that's the dilemma we're, we're, we're getting in. Trump's supporters are energized. They're far more energized, I think. I, I'm a Bernie Sanders man, I guess. Uh, we're, they're far more energized than we are, you know? And as you put it that way, that's, that's probably, a way, it gives them agency in, in a way. Um, <laughs> You want to come work for me? <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I really don't. I, what I've understood is, uh, since COP15, we were so focused on trying to get the word out that we we took this path that led us into this impasse, and now we've got to find another way uh, of dealing with this. I noticed uh, somebody this morning said that the way up is local, and that's nonsense, because this is a crisis that has absolutely, n uh, there are local things you can do, you can turn off your air conditioner, but if four million other people have their air conditioners on, that's an empty gesture. So part of the politics of this is figuring out truly collective action uh, ac across uh, borders, although nation states have a real role to play in it. But it is a problem of collective action, which is not, doesn't fall into the trap of this Freud group psychology, where people erase their capacity to reason when they get in a, when they get in a group. Uh, yeah. So are you, are you actually saying that uh, calling this, using the word disaster on, on the climate thing, that that makes it even more difficult to at, at attack that or to, to deal with this because it creates the feeling there's nothing we can do about this. Yeah. And it's at the end of the day, it, it exactly leads to the contrary of what uh, exactly. was envisaged. Yeah, that's, that's what I've experienced with this. We need a different language to talk about uh, disaster. We have somebody now working on uh, 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 speeches that people were giving in 1940 in Berlin, uh, in uh, London, about the bombings in London. And it's interesting that that language is not the language of climate disaster. It's something else. This is a problem. These are real threats. It happens every night. Here's what you do. Uh, it's, uh, and there's a kind of cynicism on the left also about this, which has been uh, terrible for us. Um, uh, 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 Greta Thunberg, for instance, has been, I think, really, what, uh, in my view, she did something good in the beginning, but she's become a terribly counterproductive voice yeah. in, in trying to deal with this problem. Um, another analogy you can think about this is, uh, and it's something I'd like to pursue in, um, in the future, is when a doctor is faced with a terminally ill patient, what's the language between them? <laughs> That also might give us some clues, a good doctor dealing with somebody who is terminally ill, because we are terminally ill, you know, and uh, mm. this is not a problem that can be talked away. We, we have gone beyond that tipping point. Yeah.
Do you have any thoughts or comments around why the language that we've been using around climate change, for example, resonates with what it sounds like a lot of people in this room, but maybe not with others? Like, what's that distinction? So, say again, just so I understand. Yeah, no, I, just sort of abstracting from your talk, just it sounds like there are terms and terminologies that um, overwhelm people when it comes to talking right. about disasters. And so, but it sounds like that's a, a subset of people. Because for example, there, when it comes to climate change, there's a very large subset of people who those facts and figures are not overwhelming, they're empowering, and they call, they're a call to action. Uh, actually, I think I disagree with you. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, I don't, I've been surprised by uh, how sporadic the climate change mu movement has been. Uh, uh, it's, there are people who are, you know, deeply involved in this day by day, day by day, day. But for instance, to have a climate change protest is good if you mobilize people to then act. When the protest itself becomes the activity, you know, I held up my sign and so on, uh, which is uh, what is increasingly happening. You're not building organizations like Extinction Rebellion by, by protests. It's a, or, uh, uh, or the, we have a whole bunch of NGOs that we're associated with. And um, they're just not growing because this protest has taken, taken another form in which somehow this, which I think comes out of the notion that this is basically a power relationship. And if you got to the people, for instance, who, are, who own the, the petrol companies, uh, if you protest against them, something will, will, good will happen against that. It's, it's beyond that. The companies have to be dismantled, you know? They have to be forbidden to do their business. I guess I am talking about capitalism. Um, you know, it's not a question of, of raising their moral tone. Every businessman I've talked to is, is see, sees that climate change as the most important, uh, 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 you know, issue of our generation. They all say it. They all walk the walk and talk the talk, whatever it's called. But they don't shut down their businesses. So, I mean, part of dealing, if we really wanted to deal with this, would be to nationalize and redistribute those businesses. That's not going to happen. You know, so I mean, it is. You know, it's a question of where the re reality of of this lies, and we're not dealing with it very so far, very well. I think the language does matter. You know, I think the language, as with any political thing, language has to be mobilizing to people in a way which leads to action. And that's, I don't know, maybe I'm too frustrated about this. I, I've done this too too long, so. Uh, All right, I, I think we do have to end there yeah, for, for several reasons. I have to go to thank you so much. Downtown, too. <laughs> well, thank you.